talk is being recorded. So I want to ask you to please um, to keep your microphones muted during the talk. After the talk, we will have plenty of time for questions. We've all become very adept at using Zoom for this kind of uh, programming. So feel free to use uh, when the time comes all the tools that you can avail yourself of, you can use the hand raise function, you can type your question in the chat, uh, or you can simply type, I have a question and I'll call on you when the time comes. Um, now, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Tafat akoen uh, who is a scholar of modern Hebrew literature, specializing in the field of secularism and religion. She completed her PhD in the Department of Hebrew Literature at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. And in 2022-23, she was a fellow at the Herbert Katz Center for Advanced Today Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She is currently a visiting research scholar at CUNY at, through the Center for Jewish Studies. And she is also a visiting scholar at NYU where she is teaching a class. Her talk today is entitled Writing Fear, Literary Apologies, Writing Fear, Literary Depictions of Musa Literature. Thank you so much, Tafat. The floor is yours. Here is, is it good, right? You see it? Okay, so I will start. Okay. Hi, hello all. I'm very happy to be here and to speak with you. And thank you so much, Francesca, for inviting me all. Although in the, I will start, I will. Although in the second part of my lecture, I will speak about a novella that I had the opportunity to examine closely last year, I want to open with broader questions and to think with you about a research that is still work in progress. I want to think about the connection between modern Hebrew literature and Musar literature, and to ask how it contributes to the understanding of Ira and how Ira is perceived. So I will explain what Ira is um, here and throughout the lecture when I speak of fear, I am referring uh, to Ira, sometimes also translated as O, oh, even though I think that fear or more specifically fear of sin capture better the meaning of the word. So forgive me if I will say sometimes Ira, sometimes fear of sin, but this is the meaning. To this research, two aims. The, for, the first is to understand the emotional aspects of secularism in modern Hebrew literature, and to think about religion, not just as a set of ideas, but also as a site of constructing emotional community and establishing the emotional convention, conventions of literature itself. The second one is to add the corpus of Musar to the research of secularism in modern Hebrew literature. While the presence of religious motives and uh, intertextual uh, connection to biblical, rabbinic, and Hasidic sources was addressed by many studies, to the best of my knowledge, the role of Musa literature in modern Hebrew literature has not been examined as a crucial source, although, as I will show today, we can learn from it fundamental ideas. Okay, so I'm starting with um, Shmuel Feiner and um, okay. Shmuel Feiner writes about Moshe Mendelssohn's Kohelet Musar, published in 1755, that the voice of Kohelet Musar was completely different and can be seen as a critical counter reaction carefully formulated against the demonic and melancholic world of Musar books. Instead of demons and threats of punishment, Mendelssohn offered a promise of happiness, beauty, and joy in a perfect world, the best of all possible worlds. The first cover of Kohelet Musar surprised its readers because it did not offer them halakha, sermons, or moral instructions, but rather participation in an emotional and human private experience. 
פיינר קומפרס מנדלסונס בקהלת מוסר to the מוסר בוק קו הישר. Both, he argues, invite the reader on a journey. However, unlike Mendelssohn, in the Musar book, it is not Newton's law of, laws of nature that govern the universe, but rather a hidden demonic forces. One's fate depends on his submission to the laws of the Torah. Furthermore, Kava Yashar encouraged passing through the dangerous life in this world with the eyes closed or lowered toward the ground in order to avoid temptation. In this worldview, in our present world, all its vanity and weakness as one's only goal is to inherit the world to come. A final comparison between Jewish enlightenment and Musar literature helps to clarify the subjects that stand in the center of the debate between these two literary traditions. Which powers govern, govern the world? How should one address it? Is the world a source of fear or of joy? In today's lecture, I want to continue this conversation and suggest how it appears in later period, during the formative moments of modern Hebrew literature in the beginning of the 20th century. I will argue that this debate, maybe conversation is better to say, is crucial for understanding the, um, the way modern Hebrew literature is considered as a secular project. I argue that at the early moments of modern Hebrew literature, as part of the formation of a new emotional language and of the Jewish subject, there was also a more specific effort to reconstruct the emotion of fear, or more precisely, to reconstruct fear as non-emotion. However, the need to reconstruct the emotional language is necessary, I will argue, precisely due to the great effective power of Musar literature, which she seeks, as Avriel Barlevav has beautifully shows in an article on the remembrance of the day of, the, of death, to make use of the transformative power of story to change both the reader and the narrator. The use of stories and literary techniques should be understood as technologies of the self, saying Avriel uh, Barlevan. Thus, Musa literature functions as spiritual guidebooks for, for self-perfection, as Patrick Koch defined them, that use literary techniques to affect the readers. In other words, the encounter between Musa literature and modern Hebrew literature is not one of halakha and agada as two uh, separate spheres. On the contrary, modern Hebrew literature joins into a very intense emotional sphere and seeks to neg negotiate with the existing emotional community in an attempt to formulate a new one. Before continuing, I want to say a word regarding the Musar genre. First, I want to emphasize that there was a tendency to understand and to translate Musar to ethic. But Musar and ethic are not the same. Patrick Koch explains that in different from ethic, authors of Musar conceived, conceived, conceived self-perfection only in relation to the divine often evolving in accordance with the normative regulation, regulations, sometimes expanding them. In other words, personal improvement constitutes an, an affirmation of God, and at the same time, a subordination of oneself interest to greater div divine plane. Things that I had it here, and I'm sorry for not sharing this paragraph with you. Ah, okay, this is the next one. It's good. <laughs> Um, but this mistake of understanding Musar as ethic, it's, 
um, brought to an interest in Musar literature, and I'm reading, in trying to establish a Jewish version of ethic, scholar of the Wissenschaft school adapted two opposite strategies. The first promoted a model of unequivocally, genuinely Jewish ethic, which encouraged the perception of the Jewish religion as, as the epitome of ethic per se. I'm, I'm skipping to the next sentence. It was just, it, it was these two divergent understanding that substantially shaped the academic discourse of later generations. We Proving a uh, Musar as a Jew Jewish ethic and laying uh, the groundwork for what would later develop in the literary genre of Sifrut Hamusar. In uh, my parallel with Hirsch Razener, an essay of Chaim Graden, which was published in 1952, the speaker, a secular writer by himself, has a dense conversation with his old friend Hirsch, who still follows the Musar pass. They engage in a deep theological debate regarding how to understand the place of Musar movements relation to the world. And here the speaker uh, speaks to uh, his friend, um, Razener. In Overdog, you always kept the windows closed, but it was still too light for you in the house of the study. So you went off to your garret. From the garret, you went down into a cellar, into a cellar. And from the cellar, you burrowed down into a hole under the earth. That's where you could keep your commandment of solitude. And that where you pursued yourself that a man thought and feeling out like his pair. And then he continues, but please remember this specifically the window, that the window that, uh, that the speaker blames uh, Razener that he wants always to close. And we will go back to this window uh, in the continuation. Although this essay is usually uh, with through the perspective of the Holocaust, at the center of their debate is a question of how to treat human desires, whether to transfer them into art or whether to fight them. In other words, what is the cultural place of lust and what can be produced from it? And I'm reading it. The writer shows how the wicked man is a victim of his own bad qualities. I think that what you say I think that that's what you said. It is really a pity about a, a arrogant rebel. He destroys other and of course he's destroyed too. What a pity. Do you think it is easier to be good man than an adulterer? But you particularly like to describe the lustful man. You know him better. There is something of him in your artist. If you make excuses for the man who exults in his wickedness, then as far as I am concerned, all your scribbling is unclean and unfit. Condemn the wicked man. Condemn the glutton and drunkard. Do you say he can't help it? He has to help it. You've sung a fine song of praise to the portrayed idols, high in violence, Finland, he says to the protagonist. If I may use this essay as a model or as a frame story, in my research, I want to draw the conversation between secular literature and the Musa literature and to ask what we can learn from it. Which emotions are considered authentic and which are not? How ira, again, fear of sin, is perceived? Why in this moment of Jewish history, do these two different types of literary con of um, types of writing emerge? What can we learn from the centrality of sin in secular? I, I say secular, but uh, in secular literature uh, about lit regarding literary conventions and in what aspect those conventions are still relevant for current literary theories. 
as one uh, example, as one uh, close example from 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 now, I will examine the important Hebrew novella Lean Wither uh, of Feuerberg by focusing on the way it uses parodic language and ridicules traditional Musar literature in order to create an emotional and literary shift necessary for the creation of a new secular subject. Necessary, of course, in the uh, in the literary eyes in, in the in parodic discourse, as shown by uh, Michael Bertin, two languages are crossed with each other, the language being parodied and the language making the parody, that, that which the author of the parody conceives as the normal and healthy language. Secularism, as we know, does not represent a completely new historical phase unattached to earlier traditions and and its relation to previous textual tradition is not based on eraser or disregard. Like parody, secularism is profoundly palimpsestual, and thus, in order to decipher its meaning, one must read through all its liars, and the new and the old, the parodied and the parodizing, alongside and against each, each, each other. Through the examination of the place of Musar literature in Feuerberg's Leanne, Wither, I will demonstrate how fear of sin was presented in the early stage of modern Hebrew literature as a non-emotion. I will argue that overcoming the feeling of fear of sin, Iratret, is a necessary step in the birth of the new subject. I will show how fear of sin is presented throughout the novella as pathological and as sickness. In other words, um, fear of sin is presented presented as obsessive thought of which one must break free in order to be born as a new and healthy individual. Wither Leanne was published in 1899 in Ashiloach after Feuerbeck's early death. And it, 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 taught, it taught as a fundamental text for understanding Hebrew literature. The narrative tells the story of Nachman, who, as the rumors in the town says, has gone mad. It opens with an event in which Nachman deliberately blows out a candle in the synagogue on Yom Kippur, an act from which there is no return. The novella follows Nachman's struggle between ascetism and religious devotion and his passion for a life celebration, a celebrating nature and youth. Through this struggle, we are brought into Nachman's intense stream of thought. The novella ends with Nachman's speech where he calls to leave Europe uh, for, uh, for the East where Jews can live healthy and free life. Feierberg was born in 1874 in the town of Novergod in Volinsk and died in the, at the young age of 24. His early and tragic death rendered his, uh, this work the status of a kind of unfulfilled promise. And although it quickly gained canonical status, its reception was also suffused with contradictions that can be seen in almost any, any text written about it. As early as 1921, uh, Shimon Rabidovich declared that Wither is the book of a generation. Yet, at the very same breeze, he argued that Feierberg falls several times into sentimentality and that the narrator is sometimes overly shrill, lacking good pace and rhythm, is too noisy and size, wells and grounds. Leanne should, should thus be treated as a representative work, one that expresses the voice of a generation. As I said, as the novella opens, an event of no return occurs. The candle is snuffed out. 
the rest of the novella is an attempt to understand how Nachman arrived to this moment. This momentous event occurs on Yom Kippur in a synagogue full of worshippers after other pupils asked him a question regarding Seder, Seder Avodah, um, regarding the work of high priest in the temple. Upon, upon hearing um, a question dealing with laws that are irrelevant to the reality of life in exile, Nachman violates the halacha and blowing out the candle. The act of blowing out the candle, an act of, that condemned him as a mad, occurs just after a conversation with his friend, diuretic, I will read it. Nachman asks Yechezkel what he shall do with his insights regarding the irrelevant laws and, um, and Yechezkel answers. I'm not doing anything. I'm standing at the crossword without knowing which way to turn. In your Hebrew literature, what is it doing? I tell you, I can't say anything deep in it. It seems to me that it too is still standing on the threshold and casting about between life and death like myself. It too has lost the old world without knowing what comes next. The condition of literature, casting about between life and death, we reflect the body of the protagonist, the living dead. Literature, like Yechezkel, stands on the threshold, stuck in a liminal situation of detachment. And therefore, it is only at that moment the moment of the candle is extinguished, that is when the threshold is crossed and the halachic law is violated, that, for the narrator of the novella, Hebrew literature can begin to be written. Nachman's famous speech, which closes the novella and directs national desire towards the East and the land of Israel, Wither was read mostly through a national pr a prism, rather than in the context of secularism. Therefore, in this part, I will show how Nachman's stream of consciousness occupied by Musar literature and how the novella constructs as a kind of stream of consciousness of a God-fearing man. In this novella, the birth of the new literature depends on the moment of separation from the fear of sin via parody of God, the God-fearing man. Um, yeah, I want to see how much time, so I will skip this one, maybe, and I will go here. The metaphor of war against the evil inclination is dominant both in Musar literature and in Musar movement. Already in the story of, um, already in the story from the duty of the heart, uh, of the heart's Chovat Alevavot, we are told of Hasid who returns uh, from successful war where he took uh, many spoils, yet upon his return, he says to those who surround him, to prepare for the great war, the great the war against the evil inclination. It is all illuminating to know that um, that that uh, the text semantic field, the root lamed chet mem, which is the root of milchama war, appears more than thirty times. Yetzerara appears twenty times. Satan eleven times. And throughout about this uh, subject um, and thoughts about this subject compromise a large part of the text. Indeed, Nachman is described as a soldier try, trying to wage war against the evil inclination. Yet, this is war destined to fail since, and I'm quoting, wherever one goes, sin follows after. A view that the evil inclinations at Feierberg were ridiculous. 
Nachman refers on three separate occasions to the important Musar book, Rishit Hofma, Beginning of Wisdom, which he defines as a central volume in on his um which he defined as a central volume on his shelf of God fearing consciousness. As noted by Mordechai Pechter, the reputation earned by the book of Rishit, uh, Rishit Kochma, its wide dis description and its popularity are well-known facts that require no proof. In this context, it is enough to note that the book's many printing in different editions and its status as a fundamental work alongside the duty of the heart as indicated by Zashla. In addition, despite having been written in the 16th, the 16th century, it was adapted as a major work of Musar literature by the Musar movement. The following passage shows how Rishit Chochmah finds its way into Nachman's stream of consciousness. I will fight with the evil urge until I drive him from my heart. Oh God, he prayed. Make me strong enough to conquer the evil urge and to worship you really truly. He ran to the bookcase to find one and shows a volume that was called The Beginning of Wisdom. His father has, has told him that every Jew was obligated to know the beginning of wisdom by heart and to obey all that was written in it. He lived through its pages until he came to a chapter that was called About Hell. It reads, the part in Rashid Chochmah that describes hell. This is a very graphic description of the appearance of hell and its various regions. Nachman reads the chapter until he appears to understand. Hell is not in some distant place. Hell is a, a, a life perverted by an intense awareness of sin. That is the true punishment. And I'm reading, the book lay open before him, but he could have been blindfolded for all that he saw. So it is all true, he thought. This is true that there is really a hell. Wherever you went, sin followed after. If you didn't say amen, the right way after a single prayer, your soul was already dim. If you forgot to wash your hands, even once before praying or eating, it was condemned to live in a frog for seven whole years. It is a terrible God. It is so hard to live in, in your world. The narrator's, the narrator's statement, wherever you went, sin follow after, a statement that, in fact, mocks the very possibility of avoiding sin, expresses a familiar voices, voice in Musar movement. In addition, if we consider the terminology of Rashid Chochma, we can understand why Feyerberg chooses is as a typical example of the semantic of war. Sin kills just like an important enemy who strike with the sword. And therefore, he who wishes to avoid it has no choices but to engage in this war. The battle against clipot and impure thoughts continues at night as well when the Rashid Chochmas reappears. And at night, oh, how terrible the nights were. The battle that we got re re rigided then. How many dreadful warnings were written in the holy books about the nighttime kingdom of the Klippa. One thing he knew, however, he was alone by himself in a terrible black world. The whole world lay in ambush to drag him down to the fairy pit to hell. And he, how weak and lowly he was. But why then the thought went on torturing him? Did he create a terrible world? God was good, but if you didn't wash your hands when you were supposed to, he might turn you into a frog. The two passages quoted 
uh, above illustrate the intense struggle Nachman experienced, expressed in feverish dense stream of consciousness and obsessive and pathological thoughts about sin. The same sentence is repeated in both passages. If you didn't wash your hands when you were supposed to, he might turn you into a frog. This description, which at first reading seemed to me like a misprint, illustrates the, circular, the circularity and obsessiveness which the awestruck mind perceived the warning regarding strict observance of the rules of, uh, for washing one's hand. A warning that was even the subject of an entire Hasidic tale about the Baal Shem Tov, who performs a tikkun, rectification, for a frag that claims to have formerly been a Torah scholar who was turned into a frag after failing to strictly adhere the rules of washing the hands. A metamorphosis as a typical example of fear, as a, 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 a example of fear and a deterrence of sinner, particularly one that is accused by the infra um, of seemingly minor laws, is the best example of exaggerated fear. Therefore, it is this specific warning, warning as a symbol of scrupulous laws that must be repeated and ridiculed. I will conclude my lecture in the way that your eyes presented as an obsession and as unhealthiness. At the beginning of the story, the narrator presents Nachman as a crazy. But throughout the story, there is a gap between the narrator who claims that the madness was expressed by ex extinguishing the candle, i.e. in sin, and between the implied narrator who believes that Nachman went mad because of excessive fear, i.e. from um, the obsessive uh, thought and from the attempt to avoid sin. The fear of sin is presented as distinctly, distinctly, it is a little bit small to me too. I just want to move it a little bit, just a moment. Maybe I will put it, sorry. I have a difficulty to see. You still see the presentation, right? Okay, I'm sorry, it was a little bit small for me. Okay. Okay, this, this gap is exactly what clarifies the course of the story, the presentation of the fear of sin as a disease, one that must be overcome in order to give birth to the healthy secular body. Throughout the novella, the tension felt between interiority and exteriority illustrates the sickness of the awestruck Jew who, secu who seclude himself from nature. The protagonist sees nature and youth outside, but is enclosed in the dead world of the Bet Midrash. This tension comes to a head uh, when he looks out the window as a kind of threshold between the external and internal world. At the moment, at a moment of doubt, the narrator observes the evil deeds of his townspeople and says to himself that he can mend the race. This, um, and I, I will, sorry. You see here, right, that what were, you see this? What were you sent here for? to repair much and purify the soul. And here, the evil inclination turns your heart to idleness, to enjoying feverality and declusion. The windows and doors of the houses are open. Are open. The homeowners sit inside the room next to the open window, windows. 
eating and drinking and enjoying the rest after the day's labor. Yet, with, with this puzzle, I will finish my lecture. How should we understand this passage? What is the scene of the homeowners? What is, why is an open window a scene? This is easier to understand with reference to the tradition of Rabbi Simcha Zisel, the altar of Kelm, pupil of Rabbi Israel Salanter. The, the altar of Kelm was well known for his sternness. A tradition cited by Dov Katz relates that Rabbi Simcha Zisel found it particularly, particularly important that anyone entering the house should remove himself from everyday matters and absent-minded thoughts. It is said that the yard of the study hall was surrounded by a tall fence and that the building's windows were always closed and covered with curtains to prevent ideal thoughts. It is even related that, and I'm reading from downstairs, once he noticed that one of the pupils, while arranging his study materials, raised the curtain of the window to observe what was going on outside. The altar of Kelm then said that since the pupil could not control his curiosity, there was no hope for him. It is thus conceivable that this radical demand uh, as an example of a broad phenomena was the source of Feierberg criticism of the God-fearing man who cut himself off from nature and the ordinary reality of the world. Friend uh, Jacob uh, Joseph Wald, friend of Feierberg, who together with others um, supported uh, Feierberg uh, when he was ill, um, writes that Judaism in general is exalted and full. I, and I, I just want to see, show this. Okay. Judaism in general is exal exalted and full of splendor, but it is very terrible. The evil inclination, the sitra acha, the klipot, the fear of sin and its punishment, hell, the holy books, the talisman, the oath, are all filled with a fearful majesty. But they steal away life. They put to death the longing of youth, the joy of youth on its splendor. And here begins the horrible, terrible war. According to Wall, the, to Wall, the struggle against the evil inclination will give way to the birth of a healthy man. There, in the land of our forefather, there will be no place for all this, those internal defects of the soul of the nation. No place for the, that heavy work conducted in the soul of he that lives in that twilight of the exile. In other words, Wall associates Zionism, nation, na, Zionist nationality with the moment of release from the fear that symbolizes the burden of the Galut exile, an internal defect, defect that of the national soul. I won't enter here into the discussion of the connection between nature, health, and youth in revival period, uh, literature in the beginning of the 20th century. All these are important issues that lie in the background of my argument. My focus though is on the connection between strict adherence to, to the, um, the Jewish law, to the halacha. I would like to propose that understanding the trajectory no, noted about, uh, noted can explain how in the beginning of secularism, a process, religious elements of strictness were perceived as sickness and as obsession. In 1907, Freud published his seminal essay, Obsessive Actions and Religious Fervor. It seems that between religious and neurotic guilt reflects a, um, 
I'm sorry, I see that my time is over. So I won't open this for I will I just will say that um I think that I will finish with with it. Um uh, you you can take a few more minutes. Yeah, you can take okay. a few more minutes. Of course. I suddenly was afraid that it's okay. So, okay. Okay, so um, Freud opening declara declaration that he's certainly not the first person to have been struck by the reasonless and uh, between a religion and an erotic guilt may indeed attest to a common perception that noted the similarities. Um, in an article about obsessive compulsive disorder and religious um, scorpalities, Paul Kefaloi, I will show it here. Uh, ask about the literary aspects of OCD type writing. If depression tends toward tragedy and psychosis can be perceived as romantic, under which genre should we situate OCD? I will suggest that obsessive compulsive behavior, behavior is most aptly described as tragicomic in nature. With this in, in mind, I would like to suggest that Feierberg's writing seeks to ridicule the obsessive Jew and that whether Leanne is not tragic or romantic as is usually understood, but rather much more parody or perhaps tragic comic. Reiser marks and imitates the stream of consciousness of the fearful person, revealing how Ira was perceived and understood at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century in modern Hebrew literature. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tafat. This was a, a really stimulating talk. Thank you for sharing some of your work in progress. Um, I, uh, so I'm sorry for questions. struggling between the medium of the... No, that, that was fine. That was fine. <laughs> and uh, so we, we, we have time for questions. And as uh, we're waiting for questions from the audience, um, I maybe I'll start and this was a uh, you know for me a beautiful sort of it took me back to a previous uh, Gilgul I studied Hebrew literature when I was in college and so this uh, you know resonated a little bit with some of the themes um you know the novellas that that I used to read when I was 20 something so uh, thank you so much for that as well but um I have a question about the theme of Ira, uh, the the fear uh, of evil, the fear of sin, uh, that uh, sort of pervades the Musar literature. But even pre Musar, it sort of reminded me of some of the themes in the Hasidic Ashkenaz literature, so pietistic literature in general, and the authors in the 19th century, right, the early authors of the, you know, Haskala literature or early Hebrew literature, they clearly have Musar in mind, but what are the, uh, what are the resonances with even earlier medieval expressions of these themes? Were you able, I don't know, you know, I'm just throwing the question out there uh, because clearly Musar is also drawing from that early pietistic uh, literature itself. So I just wonder, uh, if we can even push it further in time to tropes that have um, sort of per per percolated in Hebrew literature for centuries, uh, well before Musar. Okay, thank you so much. It it really it really question that bother me. What is the uh, definition of Musar literature? But not as the, an empty question of we need definition. I think that I, I have. Two questions for this. Um, the first is what I began the lecture with is that the definition is, is part of this um, a, attempt to find, I 
מוסר and ethic and then to put many texts together and to call them מוסר literature. So this is a maybe a more historical uh, explanation for how it became like a genre, but I think that, um, that um, I explained to myself that what I'm trying to do here is to understand that bookshelf and um, the dominant bookshelf of the Musar book. So it is also um, Hasidei Ashkenaz, you really write. And also to understand, because we have the Musar movements, uh, movement in the 19th century. And they don't just a movement, but they're also bringing back to the circulation of reading many Musar books. So I think that what really interesting me is also, also to understand who read what, who reads what, and what books became very dominant in this time, and maybe to try to organize what the Hebrew writer um, was struggling with, what books they had in mind, and what books were dominant. So I think that many of, um, I think that Part of the uh, Hasidic Ashkenaz, I think that Sefer Hasidim is very dominant in this um, time. Part of the um, um, project of um, Patrick Koch was to do a map of the Musar book. So I tried to use it, um, but I, I still need to understand. For example, with Feierberg, I, I tried to understand what's going on in, the, in his town. It's, it's there is Hasidut Chernobyl that it's not exact it's Hasidut but specific so this is part of what I'm trying to understand but Kiru, your question is really um it, it's really something that I'm trying to think and to organize some map of reading or oh, oh thank you thank you thank you Marty has uh, and you're muted. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Tafat. It was an extremely interesting uh, talk. Um, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, related to what you've just been saying, I mean, my impression is that the Musa movement was dominant among uh, Yiddish-speaking Jews of Eastern Europe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I'm reading now I.J. Singer's memoirs, and much of what you're saying is described almost exactly the same. Um, I mean, they, I think they're written in the 1950s, but they go back to the pre-World War I era, uh, where he talks about, as a child, having teachers who um, spoke uh, in, in the Musa terms that you were describing. In fact, I, I sometimes thought that, that these... Um, that these teachers must have read Dante. I mean, he's got the, it's the same kind of notion. It's the hell and the, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so I'm wondering, um, there is also an interesting moment in a story I, I, you know, that came to my mind by uh, Peretz, where he's describing people in shul on Yom Kippur, and he says, what, what do these people have to atone for? <laughs> what did they do so bad? Sorry, I didn't hear the last question, the it, last sentence. The moment in the poet story um, that takes place on Yom Kippur. And he says, what do these people have to atone for? You know, why, what, why is it that they have to feel so terrible about what, they, what they've done? So my, my question is, um, uh, uh, do you think that Yiddish literature had any influence on um on the on the literature that on the hebrew literature that you're describing i think that this is a great question and i will be happy if you will tell me again the name of the book that you read now it sounds really uh good for me i think that it's a question for lazar el hanan maybe he has better answer for this question um i i don't know I don't know exactly, and it's something that um, I, I know. I will say that, um, of course, Elazar uh, Otsela, uh, no? Do you want to answer? Do you want to say a word? Yeah, uh, maybe when you're done, I'll say a word. No, uh, say I, I want to hear you because it's really it's, it's something that bothers me, and I don't know to what what 
uh, how to answer this? Uh, oh, I mean, this is... Kiro, uh, I will ask you how much it's relevant. So wonderful to be here. And this was a, a lovely, fascinating uh, lecture. I have many thoughts. I need to be quiet because there's a sleeping baby here. But um, I don't quite know the answer, um, but I think it's uh, a very interesting question and um, a very plausible um, hypothesis. I think that this could be also kind of a point of divergence between um, or um, conflict between Hebrew literature and Yiddish mm -hmm. um, literature. I think that um, in a certain um, what I would say, I would like to refer you, I don't know if you know, the work of Roni Mazal on Yud Lamed Peretz and, um, and the way she talks about how Peretz and Gordon and other uh, authors would read uh, old, uh, would read a variety of, uh, of um, Jewish texts as um, for their affective and sensational value. I think that kind of Dante quality that was just uh, mentioned. Um, and um, in that respect, I think there's a, there might be a big place for this literature that you're talking about in Yiddish literature. Whereas in Hebrew literature, with the emphasis on Haskalah, with the emphasis on kind of the a more elevated textual uh, um, tradition, this was a bit harder to, uh, I mean, to bring in. And we can see, I mean, that, I mean, th these themes are more scarce in Hebrew literature um, than they are in Yiddish literature, where this kind of sensational, more popular um, aspect is very... Um, is very dominant. I, I wouldn't know much more to say about that than that, but I do think it's a fantastic question and something really worth um, studying, um, this um, difference. I, I can say something, I mean, uh, from a project that I work on right now has in, having to do with the, well, the horror in Uri Tzvi Greenberg's uh, Great Horror and Moon and um, other... Um, um, and and um, other texts. I mean, many people read this kind of horror and fear of death. And um, I mean, as something coming from his engagement with modernism, with kind of the Neue Sachlichkeit in Germany, all this kind of modernist philosophical uh, Heideggerian uh, thoughts. Um, I think that what you're proposing as this kind of being a translation of Vira'a, of this uh, fear of God, could also very well work there. But I do think that, I mean, he does collect this as sensational material, as affective material from old uh, Hasidic writing and old Jewish writing that he references a lot. In, in his writing, as much as he does um, futuristic and expressionistic uh, German and uh, um, and um, other texts. So in that respect, I think there's something, uh, how should I say, uh, very solid and very fruitful in what you're, uh, at least from, from my perspective, in what you're suggesting. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's like God speaking. We don't see your uh, face. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So whatever you say. Him that call. Yeah. So <laughs> I will. I I will just add to this conversation, and maybe we need to to you know, I, I think that um um specifically to uh, modern literature, <clears throat> there is a difficulty with Musa literature. If it is it, it it's much more easy uh, it's much easier for um, modern Hebrew literature in general with Hasidic writing because there is no romantic movements in this time and, and there and we can speak about biblical um, connections and it's Zionism as romantic movement so but Musa specifically has some uh, unique 
relationship with, with modern literature. And my guess will be that also it, it, to the Yiddish literature, it won't be so easy with Musa, but it's really worse. And I really, I want to maybe to speak about it more also with uh, Roni and with Elazar. And thank you for this, it's really important. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alec. If I can interject, did, did you have... I, I just want to say something um, in passing, talking about um, um, with her, I very much shared your sensation, uh, Francesca, coming back to this fantastic novella. I had the opportunity of doing that a couple of semesters ago. I taught it um, in this class. And one thing that came from the conversation with the students, and I think this goes very strongly with your kind of uh, parody uh, paradigm, um, is, is the relation of this text to, to Don Quixote. Um, with the character, I mean, there's a Sancho Pancha there, there's a, I mean, there's the ridiculous heroism and fighting, he struggles, he wrestles, he duels, he, with all the old texts and all the, and I mean, what stands in the books that you were talking about are exactly what stands in for the um, yeah for, for the chivalry uh, chivalresque novels that uh, are outdated when he reads them and uh, when Don Quixote reads them and kind of influence and mess up his mind. And in a certain sense, I think that uh, I mean it's something that came up in my class and it was I thought was a very interesting parallel. It's very interesting. Especially because when you spoke, I thought about Baruch Hulsberg uh, writing about Don Quixote and its place in the early process of secularism. So it's really interesting to think about parallels in this aspect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My... Are there any other questions? <laughs> For the big uh, audience, thank you for coming. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I'm sorry, maybe I should have uh, published it more. I had an event in NYU, but and I didn't think that uh, I need to spread the word too much. But uh, the you know some some of the so themes I know that these you know these themes are obviously they're quite broad and they've been investigated. But um, I was reminded also of Daniel Boyarin's. Uh, reflection um, in unheroic conduct, mm -hmm. where he trace unheroic conduct is basically it's a it's a reflection, it's a personal reflection on uh, masculinity in uh, in the Jewish tradition, and so he looks at Ashkenazi traditions and he sort of traces. Uh, you know, it's mostly his own made up. Uh, approach to, but it's it's based on rabbinics and and then he traces it into the 17th century and then it looks at modern uh, modern Jewish reflections, including Freud on masculinity and some of the some of the themes resonated uh, with with uh, you know what you were with you were saying. So the, the, the book is the book is entitled Unheroic Conduct and he essentially traces. The, I was reminded at the end when you know brought up the quote about OCD and the scrupulousness in um, following uh, you know mitzvot and then the ritual commitments. Um, uh, according to Boyarin, Jewish men in the Ashkenazi realm are desirable sort of the. Uh, uh, you know, the Talmud Chacham is the desirable, the sexualized masculinity ideal. And that comes under fire only later in the 19th century when new ideals of masculinity become uh, more desirable. So this, this whole, you know, idea about the OCD and the neurotic element in uh, the Ashkenazi religious tradition, it kind of resonated with that. I don't know if it's helpful, but... You know. No, it's actually very helpful. Because I think that this um, Feierberg, the text, has some conversation with with the emergence of the idea of mental health. Mm. Um, 
so I think that there is something there that I need to find more and um, it's like it's the beginning of of a conversation that we can really in this moment of the beginning we can see very clearly the fundamental ideas of of it so yeah. and that connection to secularism in a moment so thank you yeah. I will look for it thank you are there any other questions Marty or Eric <laughs> I'm uh, I'm good. Just uh, congratulations, stuff. That it was very interesting. Well, thank you for joining. Thank you for thinking with me. Thank you very much. I have to tell you, thank to tell you. you one thing. I Can. went I went to a yeshiva named after Yisrael Salanta, and we never heard a word of Musa. <laughs> no Musa, so why? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. It was really, really good. Thank you very much. Thank you much so much, Tafat. I was really happy to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much you for, for Francesca. Yeah. And thank you for all, all the help in everything. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, best of luck. And Thank we'll you. Be, we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And goodbye. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.